All right, so we are ready to roll again. Now, before we roll, just because, you know, I obviously over provision and put more stuff in here than necessary, how many people need to leave, like definitely need to leave at 4.30 versus uh, can leave at 5 o'clock? So, yep, I know we got you at 4.30 or earlier or whatever. And uh, who on the phone needs to leave at 5.30, or sorry, 4.30? I will assume you can stay unless you say that you have to go. So I'm not seeing anyone saying that you have to go. So that's good. We're going to take it to five then. Like I said, we're going to you know do a review of this stuff starting at the very beginning of paging tomorrow. But uh, but I want to try to make sure we can get as much in each day so that we can cover all the material. But really, the, the stuff at the very end is kind of just you know, good to know extra stuff, but not critical. All right, so here we are. We were just talking about control registers. We said there's various <coughs> control bits that you're going to set, turn on and turn off different functionality. Like you have to turn on protected mode before you turn on paging. You can enable or disable the ability to have large pages or global pages based on those other things. Back to this analogy. The point is, right now we don't care about segmentation. We assume segmentation did whatever it's going to do to get a linear address, right? We're now concerned with paging, and paging is all about how do linear addresses now map to physical addresses because it's not one to one. And so how we said it happens is, you know, the hardware always starts at CR3, but the OS is responsible for setting CR3 to whatever context is appropriate for this or that user space process or one context for all of kernel space. The contexts are just different translations between virtual and physical, and that's so that you can either explicitly have two virtual addresses and two different processes which don't map to the same physical, or if you're trying to do memory sharing between processes, you may want to map two virtual addresses to the same physical addresses, two different processes, so that they can share memory that way. And that's how, for instance, something like sharing DLLs between different processes, right? We don't want to waste memory by, like, if everybody loads up ntdll.dll, we don't want to, like, copy that into physical memory for everyone. We only need one copy in memory, and let's go ahead and share the, you know, read-only sections amongst all of the user space processes. So basically, in all of the user space translations, those specific linear addresses would translate to the same physical addresses, and those physical addresses would have the actual data for NTDLL, kernel32.dll, user32.dll, etc. So there's a piece at the very end of this, probably won't get to it until tomorrow. He's at the end that, you know, talks about user memory share. In fact, I'm going to skip there right now. <coughs> right? So conceptually, we all, we've already seen there's something about those tables. Conceptually, in order to save memory, one of the OS's jobs is to try to figure out where it can conserve physical memory so that it can open the maximum number of processes, right? But you want to conserve physical memory by taking things like libraries and mapping them to physical memory once and then mapping them to virtual memory many times, right? That's kind of the reason why we have um, DLLs and shared objects. The reason you pull out these libraries into like, I'm a DLL, I'm a .so. The reason you do that is so that you can map them in once. If you, can, if you statically link, as we sort of talked about a little bit in life binaries, if you statically link stuff, it takes all the code from all your libraries and like blobs it together in one giant executable. When you do that, you're making it that much you know, theoretically, the OS could share the common pieces of those blobs, but you know they could be offset by one byte, and then you can't share them. So the point is, pull them out to their own separate library, map them into physical memory once, and then uh, everybody's good. So in this picture, we're just trying to say, like, here's our 32-bit virtual memory space. Here's our you know potentially limited, less than 32-bit uh, physical memory space. Process A is different than process B, and maybe they're at different locations. Maybe they're at the same, right? So let's say that you know process A code starts at this virtual memory address. We see that process B code also starts at that virtual memory address, but they're mapped to different physical memory. And how does that happen? Two different page tables, two different page directories with different mappings for that same linear address. For those same offsets, they eventually lead to the final uh, location from the page table to page that has a different final entry so that one of them maps to this physical frame one of them maps to that physical frame. So 
conceptually that's how that works. So here's two virtual, same virtual address, different actual physical address. And here is two virtual addresses, same physical addresses, right? So this guy right here at this virtual memory address points to shared library chunk two, or, well, sorry, arrow, points to shared library chunk one. This guy at the same virtual memory address points to shared library chunk one. And if you really want, you know, let's say in this process that virtual address was already taken, right? So we talked about DLLs and relocations and we said if you're trying, you know, multiple DLLs, but they're going to just have some default location where they want to be in virtual memory, right? And so when this guy loads first, he already took that memory. So the next DLL comes along and says, I want to have that same address too. And the OS loader says, no. It moves it up to some other different virtual address. But thanks to the page tables, you can still map it to the same physical address. The thing can still be shared behind the scenes. Right? And this is sort of what it would look like if you were visualizing it with those page directories, page tables, right? Task A is process A. Task B is process B. Each of them gets, you know, a different page directory, for instance. This PDBR, that was that CR3. I don't know why it makes it look like it's in a table. But. So this guy gets, you know, a different uh, pointer to this uh, page directory. So each of these two processes have different page directories. That's signified by them both being on different locations. But within these page directories, or some, you know, for different, for actual different virtual memory addresses. So here, the virtual memory address is sort of, you can see page directory entry, which would be like index one. That maps to this shared page table. Over here, index zero maps to that same page table. So starting at the page directories, they have different page directory entries, but they combine to point at the same page table. And for that page table, that page table can be, you know, mapping to different shared um, pages, right? And it doesn't have to happen at the page table level. You could get all the way to the point where they're not sharing a page table, but for two translations in the front, they could have different page tables. So you could have this one right here and this one right there actually map to the same, you know, physical frame, right? So it doesn't have to be only that you get to the shared page table. You can get all the way to separate page tables, which map to the same physical frame or page, right? So that's sort of how conceptually you got different process spaces that they can share stuff for. They can explicitly keep their code independent on different physical things so that when they write to the same virtual memory addresses, they're not clobbering each other. Any questions on that quick before I go back to the main line? Okay. That's kind of, you know, conceptually, you've got two different virtual address spaces, one physical address space. And in practice, you've got two different page tables, page directories, but maybe eventually they lead to the same physical memory. Any questions on the phone? Mike had a last sound video. Um, Mike, were you, uh, I assume this is still about this topic. Will the OS make multiple copies for a multiprocessor system? Can you really clarify that? Multiple copies of what? Maybe he was talking about the kernel uh, virtual memory address space, in, in which case the answer would be no. Yeah, so what do all these uh, layers of dereferencing, right, do to uh, performance? And yes, obviously, if you have to have the hardware go through some tables, it has, a, it has again, a little bit of a um, performance hit. But again, we'll eventually get to the point where you can go directly to this virtual memory page, translates to this virtual memory, uh, sorry, to this physical address, this physical frame. And then all you need to do is go that virtual address top part goes to that physical address top part. And then just take the bottom part, this last like 12 bits or whatever, and use that as an offset. It was an offset into the virtual address. Use the same offset into the physical address. So yes, obviously, it always has more performance impact. And that's why they added caching, so that it doesn't have to walk tables each time. It just the first time it walks the table, the second time it says, aha, I know that that virtual goes to that physical. All right, so Mike was actually asking about the DLLs in memory, and therefore, Will the OS make multiple copies for a multiprocessor system? The answer, I believe, should be no. So he's asking, you know, if you've got a multiprocessor system, you know, do you have multiple copies of shared DLL? 
The answer is no, because you've got a multiprocessor system. You've got one memory space. You've only got one big bank of RAM, right? So that multiprocessor is more about the notion of, you know, how do those guys share that same RAM? But you have different and have different memory banks for different CPUs. Yes, you could have, you know, certain regions of physical memory, you know, only used by this CPU and only used by that CPU. But in general, uh, what the OS is going to do is it's going to have its own data structures about like, here's my, here's my total list of, you know, all of the, um, my total list of all the physical frames that I can use, right? And then it's going to be marking them as used or unused and stuff like that. When it needs to find some memory, it says, okay, let me check my giant, you know, list of free and used memory. And I'll say, okay, well, I've got free memory there, so I'm going to go ahead and map something to that. Right? And so, yes, different processors could theoretically have different data structures saying that they're allowed to use different physical regions. But again, the question is, where are those data structures? They're in RAM anyways. So you're really just making two different data structures and if you want to isolate between them. But what is Jessica saying about on multi-core systems? No. Oh, yes, yes. So multi-core systems. Right, so, well, is a multi-core system technically, Jessica, is it, does it imply have each core has its own RAM? Because I was under the impression that they're still all going to the same RAM. Maybe she was answering it the same way that I was answering. I think so. That's what I'm timing. Yeah. I thought there was like one bus. Exactly. There's, there's one chipset, there's one north bridge which accesses one place that you can get to RAM. So let the debate continue. So this is where we're going to start and we're going to dig down into all of that once we resolve this question. Uh, Jessica, no, at this time I cannot hear your mic. I could hear it, hear it earlier. But I don't know. Yeah, right, exactly. And multi-core systems, you know, and just, right, multi, if you got multiple CPUs, whatever caching type stuff is there, you know, L1 or L2 or L3 stuff. Some of it's going to be shared. Some of it's going to be, you know, on the actual CPU. If it's a cache that's on the CPU, obviously, that's definitely, you know, per system. But yes, in general, there is, you know, only one way to get to RAM, so everyone's uh, sharing their physical memory. And that's why there is a notion back in the day when they were trying to, you know, deal with how do we deal with, uh, multiprocessor systems, there was a notion of like this CPU is going to be the master CPU. There's going to be other slave CPUs and maybe this CPU will always be running the code which manages the OS and stuff like that. And these other CPUs will maybe run user space code in parallel. Right? But there's still this one which is like this is the only one which is allowed to access the RAM. And that's a way that you can avoid contention, right? Because if you can run kernel code on different processors, then you have to have, and that is the case on symmetric multiprocessor SMP, right, symmetric multiprocessing systems, kernel code can be running on either processor. And they have to deal with, within the OS, <coughs> how does the kernel, you know, make sure that they lock this so that, you know, I'm going to access this structure, I must access the new text so that the other processor, which could be doing something completely independent but wants to access it, uh, doesn't do it. So I scrolled up. So that is a good point that, you know, in the newest architectures, Intel and uh, AMD, you do have the memory management unit on the actual, uh, in the actual CPU. Now, how that affects the RAM, I'm still pretty sure there's one big bank of RAM, but I'm not going to bet my life on it. So I'll have to look into that, really. And, you know, Jessica may know. Has an opinion. Just, I thought it was one MMU per processor, and the cores on the processor shared the MMU. 
which makes it an even weirder question about cores versus processors. You're looking at multiple multiple chips on one die. I think uh, the major answer here, Mike, is uh, no one knows, and we'll have to look it up. But, I'm also on. but certainly, um, I really think it would be. I don't know. It would seem strange to me if uh, the architecture allowed multiple address lines into the RAM at the same time. But honestly, I mean, I could see it happening, but I could see it inducing a bunch of different complexity issues. So, you know, we'll have to look it up. So here's where we're at right now. We've got our little analogy about, you know, we're going to have to walk these tables. Everyone's got their own tables. The tables may overlap insofar as the kernel may want to share stuff. You know that the kernel only has one virtual memory address space for itself. So there's one set of directories and tables for all of kernel. That means every single uh, kernel module can access everywhere. The kernel itself can access everywhere. So we need to dig down. Oh, stop. Break it down. So, what's going on at the beginning of this picture, other than MTN? We always start at CR3. That hardware always starts at CR3, so that when you ask it to access memory for the first time, it doesn't have a cache in its cache, which we'll talk about later. It goes to CR3, and it says, I expect that at CR3, you, the OS, no, okay, sorry. CR3, first of all, is a physical address. So the OS is responsible for saying, dear, C dear you know, CPU, dear hardware that accesses RAM for me, here is the physical address where you should go to find this table. And so it says, go to this physical address, go some offset into it. You know, it'll break up the linear address however it wants. But here's the physical address where you should find the table. I'm going to say something else and I forgot it. So I think it's sufficient for now to say that, you know, the OS has to set up a table somewhere in physical memory, and the OS has to put that address of that table into the CR3 register. And that way, when the hardware tries to access memory, the paging is enabled, everything works out good. So uh, this right here, this star 32-bit aligned into 4K boundary, what this is saying is that the actual physical address, how it's specified in the uh, CR3 register, is per this down here. So the CR3 is, again, one of these sort of quasi-data structure things. How the hardware accesses it is it says a page directory must always be aligned on a 4 kilobyte boundary. So that means your page directories must always start at 0, hex 1000, hex 2000, hex 3000, et cetera. The bottom, four, the bottom 12 bits must always be 0. And that's why when we look at this data structure, we can see that the CR3 value, the bottom 12 bits, it knows that this physical address must be aligned so that the bottom 12 bits will always be assumed to zero. And so it can use the bottom 12 bits for various flags and stuff. In this case, there's two flags. We don't care about them because they, have, they pertain to caching and we don't really go over like the actual caching of pages at this point. We'll only talk about caching of virtual to physical translation. We don't care about those, and the point is the hardware just needs to grab those upper whatever 20 bytes, 20 bits, take the upper 20 bits, assume the bottom 12 bits are zero, put them together, and go to physical memory at that location to find this table. Right? So that's how it deals with finding the first page directory. Once it has the first page directory, we had that linear address which was broken up into different chunks. And what I didn't say, I forgot to say, was in this translation, which we're going to look at, this one of four possible translations, we're talking 32 to 32, four kilobyte pages. And so this is a 32-bit address. It's translating to a 32-bit address. And how the hardware breaks it up is it says, I'm going to use the top 10 bits. That's with this little line with a slash and 10 right here. It's saying on this, you can think of it like a 10-bit wide address bus or whatever. 10-bit wide bus. I take the top 10 bits on my linear address and use that as an offset into, as an index into the page directory. So 
just for saying it now, the pictures won't say it as well, but later. Hardware takes the top 10 bits, offsets into the page directory once it's found the page directory from the CR3. Takes the middle 10 bits, accesses the, right, takes the middle 10 bits and uses it as an offset into the page table once it's found the page table. And how it finds the page table is from the page directory as we we'll see in a bit. So you start at the CR3, go to an entry in the page directory. That will tell the hardware how to find the page table. Uses the index. That will tell the hardware how to find the page. Uses the last 12 bits as the offset into the page for the you know, byte, 2 byte, 3 byte, whatever the size of the memory you're trying to access at the moment is. It uses that as the offset to the actual address to read 1, 2, 3, 4 bytes. All right, so what I'm trying to say here in these pictures is, how does it find the page directory? It starts with CR3. How does it find the page table? It starts with the page directory, takes those upper 10 bits right here. That's an index into the page directory, which is a bunch of different structures. This picture at the bottom is the structure definition with a little bit of description. So it turns out these structures, unlike the GDT, are just 32 bits wide rather than 64 in this type of memory translation. So each of the entries in the page directory is just a 4 byte field where the page table address is again just some upper, this is going to be a physical address telling you where in physical memory the page table is. And as before, it's just required by the hardware that your page table must be aligned on a 4 kilobyte palm tree. Right? So the hardware can only take those top 20 bits, assume the bottom 20, uh, 12 bits of the physical address are 0. You just take that, add on 0, 0, 0 into hex. Uh, and so that then it knows it's got a 32-bit address in the 32-bit physical memory space where it finds a page table. All the rest of it are a bunch of, you know, as I said before, you could take those bottom 12 bits and use them for whatever sort of uh, data structure flags and stuff you want. Yes? So you, really get to, you talk previously about the, the, the concept of global entries that various, that they get left um, and just are there and not cleaned up between swapping between processes. Why is that flag ignored? Is that set as ignored? You know, I'd never noticed that until you just said it now. I have a feeling that, you know, I'm not even now sure. Uh, that flag actually exists both at the page directory level and the page table level. I have a feeling it's there. I know it's there in the page table level and I'm uh, pretty sure that it's not ignored at that point. And so I'm not sure why it's here other than because you definitely don't want to cache uh, this mapping of virtual to physical. What you want to cache is this next one. This one does have a global thing which is not ignored. And so I'm not sure why they put it there actually. Especially if they're still calling it ignore. So that's a good, good catch. I've taught this class now. This is my fourth time. And I've looked at this sort of stuff a lot. And I didn't pay attention to that. I was just like, oh yeah, global flag. Good. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure it's because the notion of caching a mapping, the notion of global is cache virtual to physical, like end physical, the actual page in physical RAM. And so it doesn't really make sense to be like caching this sort of chunk. Well, unless potentially you're actually caching an entire table of like constant DLLs maybe. Mm. Where I would see it being more likely to be used is something like maybe if you set something as global at this level, then everything underneath it, so everything the page directory, so we know the page directory has many page tables that it points to potentially, right? It could be, you know, trying to say that this is, uh, you know, whether it allows or disallows each of those page tables to use global. But that's entirely speculative and it's probably not the case. It says ignored, probably ignored. And I'll have to go in and uh, just look at the actual, the way you resolve this sort of ambiguity is you just go into the actual manuals and leave it. So I don't know. All right, so we don't care about these flags yet. We're going to come back to all these flags later on. 
But right now, all we care about is the fact that you had a physical address which got you to the page directory. For each entry in the page directory, it potentially specifies, you know, if it's being used, and it need not always be being used. If it's being used, it'll specify a data structure like this. This data structure, the top 20 bits, tell the hardware, here's the next physical address to find your way to the page table. Right? So in that case, you went page directory entry and a 20-bit piece that you add to an assumed 12 bits of zeros. And that gets you the base physical address of the page table. From the page table, we have almost the exact same type of data structure. Yet again, take the top 20 bits, assume the bottom 12 bits are zero, and that will get you to the final page or frame where you actually have data. So in this way, we've walked these two tables, and we've finally gotten to the actual thing. So we took 10, top 10 bits to get an index into the page directory, middle 10 bits to get an index into the page table, and that led us to this physical address, which tells us where the actual page is. And finally, we use the last 12 bits, the offset portion of this linear address that we're breaking up, the hardware is breaking up. It takes the last 12 bits and says, OK, now I've got that physical address from the page table. And that'll say, offset this much into that physical address. That's where the data you want to access is. You're trying to get it from virtual address or whatever. And I've now just, as the hardware, I've now just translated it to physical address where the data is actually stored. And again, it would be OS who said all of this, set up all these tables to say where it wants uh, virtual memory to map to in physical memory. Let's see what I had in these comments that I skipped over. Let's see if I hit them or not. Yep, well, I did hit the backtrack correctly. Let me hit that. Yeah, so there is really nothing particularly special about any given physical frame of things other than, other than to just say that, you know, they are just you can think of them like arbitrary slices of four kilobytes, but it's not an arbitrary slice. It's a four kilobyte aligned slice of uh, things. So you, can only, you can't have a page that starts at physical address you know, 15 and goes to physical address 1,015. It always starts at zero and goes to 1,000. It starts at 1,000 goes to 2,000. So that, that's why I call it like you know, the atomic unit of memory management. You have to have a frame that starts at zero and is always whatever your page size is. And why am I bringing up other virtual memory? I don't even really want to say that in my current context. So that was, again, just to reiterate, this is the same picture. Having seen what we just saw, right? So now we would theoretically, well, yeah, I said I want to take it to five. So we'll at least start drilling down on each of those entries and we'll come back to them tomorrow. Right, so let's drill down on this. We saw that. We said each of those entries, the majority component, the majority of the bits, 20 of the bits, is just telling you a physical address to get to the next place. 20 of the bits in CR3 gets you the physical base address of the directory. 20 of the bits in the directory entry gets you the physical address of the table. 20 of the bits in the table entry gets you the physical address of the page. And then you just take whatever bits are left over, the last 12 bits in this case, and that gives you offset to an actual physical address in RAM which you want to read data from. All right, so any questions for now, not about those, you know, flag bits and stuff, but just questions about this translation uh, that the OS sets up to let the hardware knock down. Any questions on the phone? All right, so Jessica is saying that uh, it is the case that because they each have their own memory management unit, uh, the uh, multi-core systems which have their own memory management unit in the CPU are able to access the RAM independently of each other. Which presumably they're, then the hardware is responsible for enforcing some sort of mutual exclusion so that they don't both write to the same, you know, at the same time. And Corey's asking where PFN base <coughs> fits into this. Um, I sort of mentioned it. Yes. Sorry, what is the PFN base? It, exactly. We don't know what the PFN base is because it's a Windows specific thing. So how Windows manages its physical memory in order to determine what's available and what's not available, 
it has its own data structures, and I kind of already mentioned it that under the assumptions of you know everyone's access, all CPUs are accessing the same RAM. You can think of it like um, bill over to the board. Yeah, didn't mention it. I think everyone must have got the virtual machine password right. You can think of it like if you've got you know some amount of physical memory. This is your is man. Right? You've got some amount of physical memory and you can only utilize it in four kilobyte chunks, right? So this is four KB and you start at zero and this is hex one thousand. This is hex two thousand, etc. Right? So you know that in reality all you really need to start, we know these always must be four kilobyte aligned. So when you're thinking, when the OS is keeping, the OS has to keep some data structure somewhere saying what's used, what's unused, right? What if I mapped from virtual memory to that physical memory? What if I not mapped? So somewhere there needs to be a data structure that the operating system manages, <coughs> which says what's mapped, what's unmapped. In Windows, there's this notion of PFN uh, base or PFNs. PFN stands for page frame number. And as you might expect, the minimal information you have to keep here if you know that this bottom pit is always zero, you really just have to keep this page frame number saying frame zero is this chunk, frame one is that chunk, frame two is that chunk. So you minimally only really need to keep, you know, 20 bits worth of page frame numbers in the maximum case where you can say, you know, zero through whatever two to 20 is minus one. You can say, I know that frame three is currently being used. I know that frame five is currently free. And so, the OS can have this big list of, you know, all the frames that are free and not free. And then in the case of Windows, it makes it more complex uh, in that, you know, it keeps a bunch of other data about this guy may be used at the moment, but it, it, it has a bunch of data structure. It has a bunch of, you know, states that it keeps about things where something can be, you know, straight up used right now. But something could also be freed in the sense of, Let's say you just closed a program. You just closed a program, it's going to consult its database and say, well, that program was mapping to, you know, it goes down, it, when it's closing a program, it walks its page directories, page tables, and it says, for each, you know, terminal node there that points at a final frame, you know, those page table entries are going to say, you know, for this virtual address, you know, I know that that pointed at physical address, you know, 5000, right? So, you know, this, Paging information, info. the paging info, which is, you know, collectively the page directories, page tables and stuff like that, is going to have various pointers into physical memory saying, I'm using that right now. But the OS may have notions beyond this of whether the thing is just used or unused. It may say, okay, well, you just closed this program. So all of these are technically free right now. But, for instance, you may remember that back in the day, DOD, was it Red Book? And stuff like that, those, uh, those criteria for like, you know, this is a uh, C2 system, this is a B1 system, right? Before common criteria, there was these DOD criteria of what your OS must enforce in order to be some protection of. Because of that, and because of Windows, you know, back in the day got whatever it was, C2, I don't remember. The DOD criteria may have said something like, you may not leak memory between processes, right? So you may close this thing and you may say that ostensibly these virtual, this physical things are free, but in order to actually enforce that you're not like, someone doesn't just, you know, do a malloc in kernel memory and they say, hey, kernel, give me, you know, five, five pages worth of data and it just happens to give it this page, right? You don't want that data from that old process being exposed for new processes and stuff like that. So Windows, in order to achieve this, um, this certification level, they have to, for instance, you know, zero out these things before they can reuse them. So it's like you must zero out the actual data in physical memory before you reuse it. And that's why there's this other additional complexity on top of just straight up used or unused which says this is unused but it's not sanitized yet. This is unused but it has been sanitized. And so it keeps these other like collections of physical memory which, you know, it can only pull from the, you know, unused but sanitized sort of thing. Otherwise, it doesn't achieve its uh, criteria. 
So anyways, in terms of uh, Corey's notion of, you know, he's asking where does this other kernel space thing come into play, this uh, PFM base. PFM base talks about some data structure that Windows has. So off to the side, this is physical memory. Uh, that's the actual physical memory, but off to the side, you know, Windows may have some other little thing. And this is the PFN, so page frame number database. I don't remember whether it's a linked list or array. I'm pretty sure it's an array. It says, you know, for this um, page frame number zero, so page frame num index zero in this database corresponds to index zero in the physical memory, but it'll say something like, you know, this is, you know, active right now, right? An active tells the OS, like, hey, don't just go reassigning that physical memory to someone else. Or, you know, this one may say, you know, free but unsanitized, right? That sort of thing. So Windows keeps this additional state about each of the physical addresses so it knows how it can use them or not. All right. But yeah, the... Uh, Okay, so Mike clarified that his question was about when we're talking about shared memory on a non-multi-core system, meaning like, you know, everyone goes to the same RAM, even if you have multi-processors, but, you know, they all go through the same memory controller, then, you know, he was asking about would DLLs get, you know, mapped, would each processor essentially, each, you know, each kernel running on each processor would, you know, map, double map things, and the answer is still no. You know, the kernels between multiprocessor systems are synchronizing with each other. You know, there is only one virtual memory address space for each process. And, you know, when, when whatever code on whatever processor is accessing and updating those uh, virtual memory address spaces, it needs to make sure it's, you know, smartly using the least possible physical RAM. So, really, the OS's core goal with respect to that is use as little physical RAM as possible so I can load as many you know, processes as possible without having to swap in and out between hard drive, because that's extremely slow. It's, you know, a million times slower or whatever. And yes, as he says, this notion of each chip having its own memory management unit and therefore potentially being able to independently go out to RAM, uh, in the very newest sort of processor architectures, they've moved the memory management unit out from the north bridge. Well, they've moved the north bridge into each core and that uh, you have full independent memory access, at least according to this conversation here. But that's on my list to look up later as well. All right, so we're going to dig into this in our last half an hour, and we'll, of course, go back over it again tomorrow. We want to see what the point of all those flags is. And what do we care about and what do we not care about? All right, so we skipped over entirely that CR3. There were two flags there, and I said we don't care about them because they're related to caching. <coughs> so this is a page directory entry. You need to think of these as being, you know, at each index into the page directory, there's one of these structures. And it may be, you know, completely zeroed out. It may not even be used at the moment. But if it's being used, it's going to have this data structure. Right, so we know the main point of a page directory entry is to get you the physical address to get to the page table to complete the locking of these tables. But the key, the super key flag here is the least significant bit. It is the present flag. So we had seen present flag before in the segmentation, and we said that you know if this is not set, you know maybe the hardware will do an interrupt and say you know hey you're trying to access a segment, but the descriptor says it's not even present. Same general notion here, except I generally don't see that notion being used at segmentation, and you definitely always see it being used in paging. The notion is here, for instance, if you're not translating virtual, if you've got, you know, some virtual, let me put it this way, right? We know that each process has, you know, this virtual 32-bit space, right? But when you load up calc.exe and calc.exe is, you know, one megabyte or whatever, you're loading that one megabyte into the 32-bit space. What about all the virtual memory on either side of it, right? There is no physical memory backing that virtual memory. So for all of the translations and page directories and page tables and stuff like that, for those virtual addresses where there is no calc.exe or any of the DLLs, 
there's always these gaps in the virtual memory space where there's just simply nothing using it at the moment. For all of those gaps in the virtual address space, page directory and page table entries should be such that when the hardware breaks it up and takes the top 10 bits, it gets into an index to get one of these page directory entries and that thing should be like entirely zero wiped out. So that when the hardware checks the present flag, it sees, hey, you're trying to access a linear address which got me to this index in this entry, but the present bit is set to zero. This virtual address does not have physical memory backing it, and the hardware then throws a page fault, which we talked about very briefly, and we said the hardware, you know, just automatically does this, and when it sees that someone somewhere tried to access virtual memory for which the present flag is set to zero, <coughs> it does a page fault, and a page fault is handled by one, creating a special type of interrupt, and two, the um, CR2, that we said before, CR2 grabs the address of whatever code was executing and tried to access it. So, one second. So, for instance, a very common thing is like null pointer dereference, right? So, you may have some code and, you know, for whatever reason, the code is wrong and at some point you get a pointer set to zero and you try to access memory at that address is zero. In a proper leaf setup, you know, virtual memory address space, and actually, it's the fact that on Linux, you know, the properly set up Windows virtual memory address space, there is nothing at address zero. So first of all, I should say in Windows, kernel memory is at high addresses, 8000000 and greater. So from 8000 to F, 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 F. And user space code is from 0 to 7 FFF. So because Windows is not mapping anything to address space 0, when the hardware comes along and your, you know, calc.exe or your, you know, little program tries to access linear address space 0 because it's trying to dereference a pointer, go to memory at address 0, because paging's turned on, the hardware is in play here. The hardware says, okay, I will take the address 0, I will take the top 10 bits, that is index is zero, and it goes into the page directory, and what it's going to find is a page directory entry, which is unused and therefore all zeros. If it's all zeros, the present bit is set to zero. If the present bit is set to zero, it's going to page fault, set CR2 to whatever code is accessing it. And that's why, for instance, the debuggers can actually like find who just caused this problem. Like, how do you know where it was uh, trying to access zero? It's because the CR2 gets set, a debugger will know to go check the CR2 to find the culprit. Yes? So when you're actually doing the paging memory out to, to, to disk, is what's actually going on there that it is throwing a page fault and it's just that the kernel is intercepting it and saying, actually, I do know where that is and I'll put it there in a minute. Yep. And just behind the scenes so we don't ever see that that's gone wrong. Exactly. So the whole point of paging out to disk is that the kernel will set this present flag to zero. But then it'll take all, so I didn't say it here, but it's in the manual. When the present bit is set to zero, Intel says, hey, you can use all the rest of the bits for whatever you want. And what the kernel uses for that whatever you want is some information to help it find where on disk it is. So it's got that page file, like pagefile.sys or on Linux, you call it the swap file, swap partition, right? It has some data structure on disk where when it has to take stuff out of RAM, it has to set it to zero, right? It's being used. The virtual memory is being used, but there's not enough physical memory. It needs physical memory for something else. And so what it does is it takes that physical memory, reuses it, and then it sets this to zero, sets some data in the rest of the bits so that it can find it later, find it on disk. And then, as she said, if you try to access that, a page fault will occur, but the page fault handler is going to go check this entry in this current context, which is executing, and it's going to say, all right, yes, my present bit is zero, but is the rest of that data look like one of those data structures that tells me it's on disk? And if so, I will go get it from disk, fill it in, you know, over, you know, find some physical memory, which is free, and maybe I'll have to kick out some other physical memory, but I'll find some physical memory that's free, or I will make physical memory that's free, and I will copy that data off of disk back in there I'll lock these page tables and I'll fill in the terminal entry so that it maps to the correct physical address. Like, right? So this will be set to zero, or maybe sometimes this will be set to one, but this will be set to zero. They both have present flags. And so either way, it needs to make sure that if, if it finds that someone's trying to access something which is kicked out to disk, 
It goes out to disk, finds it, finds a free physical frame. You know, maybe it has to kick someone else out, but it finds a physical frame, takes from disk, copies it to that, and then goes back and, and re-enters the correct translation to get that linear address to a page table, to get that page table to a physical address, et cetera. Question? Uh, sort of. Um, so these all also have to be loaded into uh, memory. They can't be ever be page, uh, like the, uh, the page table entries and all that. Right. Stuff. Can the page table entries be paged out, for instance? Right? You know, can your, these page tables and page directories, they are also in physical memory and they're also in virtual memory and stuff like that, right? And so he's asking, you know, can these be paged out? I believe page tables can actually be paged out. But I believe that page directories cannot. So the OS needs, when it's got that big array of like, here's all my physical memory, it needs to like set up, it needs to start out and say, look, for these chunks of physical memory, I'm going to put a bunch of page directories there. And those better never be kicked out to disk, right? For these chunks of physical memory, I'm going to, by convention, use that range for whenever I need a page table. I'm going to check somewhere in there. But maybe those can be paged out to disk because, you know, I'll get uh, a page fault when I try to access it. When I try to go from the physical, well, let me think of it. Yeah, when you go try to go to the physical address, you know, maybe you successfully, like I said, you always have to have this page directory in. But when you try to take that physical address, tack on the 12 bits of zeros, you try to get to that. Yeah, how you would specify it is you would basically say, you know, this would not be present. And so if this was set to not present, the page table could be paged out to this. Uh, but even on that, if I explain it, it's going to get to the text. I'm probably going to miss explaining. So I think, I'm pretty sure page tables can be paged out. Pretty sure page directories cannot be how the OS actually deals with the implementation details of figuring out my page directory is missing versus my, you know, actual terminal page is missing. How it details with the specifics of that, I think, would be dealt with in that using the top 31 bits for whatever, right? So I'm pretty sure there's a different sort of data structure indicating, hey, you know, this 31 bits, if, if, page, if present is set to zero, this 31 bits can either say, hey, you're actually missing, you know, a a final frame or it can say, hey, you're actually missing a page table. And, you know, it can tell you either way where to get it off of disk. So that's the basics. But were you going for something else with that? Uh, I'm just, no. just wanting to say that, yeah, you could, these, these page directories and page tables need to be in physical memory, you know, for the hardware to find them, right? So, so is that always the case if it's, if the present flag is zero and it's one through 31 or zero? It means there's nothing back in it. But if one through thirty, if it's zero, and one through thirty-one have some data in it, then there's something back in it. it just not necessarily. It. It's just OS specific what happens at that point. There need not necessarily be something backing it, but typically that's how it's going to be. It's if present is set to zero, it's OS specific what the other thirty-one bits mean, right? So they may mean if something's backing it. They may have some complex things. But in the general case, yes, the other thirty-one bits typically are going to be used to refer to. Hey, this is out of my page file on disk. And different OS is going to have a different way of doing that. All right. So, so that's the, the key point on the present flag there. Uh, next, we have the read-write flag. And the read-write flag has to do with whether or not the page you're trying to... So we said before that the hardware has a notion, when we were talking about segmentation, the hardware has a notion of this is a code type access, or this is a data type access, right? Within the data type accesses, it also has the notion of I'm trying to do something to read data, or I'm trying to do something to write data. And so this read-write flag is, you know, if you have, for instance, the CPU is trying to execute the instruction, move from EAX to, you know, RAM at, you know, square brackets, EBX, or something like that, right? Trying to move from register to memory. When the processor executes that instruction, somewhere it's setting, hey, this instruction is about writing to data, writing to memory, right? And alternatively, right, if it was a move from angle brackets EAX to EBX, it would say, hey, this instruction is about reading data. 
The OS, when it's dealing with these, uh, with these page level chunks of memory, it can say, look, for this chunk of memory, you are not allowed to write to it. Right? This is read-only memory. And so if it sets this to uh, zero, it sets this flag to zero, this should only ever be read from but never written to. Right? So you can think of that like, for instance, maybe you want your code section to not be uh, updatable, right? You want your code section to be executable and readable, but not writable, sort of like we already have in segmentation. So if you have some chunk of memory that you want to be read-only, actually a better example would be like your R data section, right? You've got a bunch of strings in your thing. You don't want to accidentally be like, you know, overwriting your strings. So you got some chunk of data which maybe per the binary format says, you know, the binary format, the P file says, this chunk of my memory, when I'm, ma when I'm mapped from disk into memory, I want you to take this chunk, which I call R data, and I want you to make that non-writable, right? And so when the OS loader is loading up some binary, they can say, aha, I see that for virtual memory address spaces, this, which is the R data section, I should make that as non-writable. And how it implements that is by putting, taking the flags and saying, you know, this page for, you know, this four kilobytes of that section, that is non-writable. You know, for the next four kilobytes, that's also non-writable. But maybe the next part is your data section and it's readable and writable. Yes? Do you have any insight as to why the page directory entry version of that flag, which is so much coarser, actually overrides the page table entry version of that flag, which suggests that you need completely different page tables for different permission levels? Well, I got stuck on this in the other one, saying it the right way. So it definitely is the case that I think what it's really all about is that the way the hardware does it is you can think of it like least privilege or something else like that. But the point is, if you have like one big blob of memory which you want, you know, all of it to be read only. It is the case that the PDE entry, that the page directory says like all of this huge chunk of memory I am, you know, saying that can never be writable, right? As far as why you would want to set that at the page directory level rather than, you know, set it at all the levels in between so that you can have more granular, I would say the point is less about marking large chunks of space as read-only. And it's more about having, uh, well, I don't know. It gives you that capability, so one could say it's about that. But I would say it's probably just for, yeah, I don't know. I can't think of a good reason why an OS would want to say, like, this big blob can never have any read-write chunks within it. So I don't, wait, hold on. No. What about copy and write? I don't know if that's a good reason either. So I don't, I'll just go ahead and punt and say no, I have no thoughts on why an OS would want to reduce its granularity in that way for some chunk of memory. But what I will say is that, generally speaking, it doesn't do that. Right? So it generally won't say all of this huge swath of memory is, you know, read-only now. Right? Typically, this is going to be set as read-write, but then you get down to the page table, which has an equivalent field, and the page table will say, you know, this all of the different physical frames that this page table can access, this one's read-only, this one's read-write. So, Could it just be for uh, if multiple you know, processes are sharing the same page table, so that way you don't have different one for each one. Um, but this process could be only read, and then this one could be read, right? What the point is, if it's saying here, and you know, I'm definitely going to have to double check this. You know, ask this question again. I have a matrix later from the Intel manual where it says what combinations equal what. Yeah, it looks like you got it already. So confirm that what I'm saying here on the slide is correct. The way you wrote the slide is unclear. Okay. Because what it looks like is that read-only overrides. Yes. But that read-only always overrides read-write regardless of which one has Right. This it's function. implying that as long as read-only is set in page directory, it's always read-only. The way this is written, it reads as the read-write flag overrides the equivalent flag in the PTEs, not the only setting the overrides the equivalent flag in the I think what I'm trying to say is just, you know, this flag overall, whether it's set to read only or set to read write, 
Yeah, okay, I got what you then. It, it, you wouldn't think of it like it's it forces any read only pages in the PTEs to be read right. Yeah, so it's not. Which is how I originally read it. Which I got was, Which is a lot more worrisome than, than minimum privilege. Right, yeah. So, okay, I think we got that. We'll, we'll, we'll see the total overall, like what combination of a page directory and a page table entry, right? If this one says read only and the page directory says read write, which is it? Well, I'm claiming here it's read only. If this one says read write and the you know, page table says read write, what is it? It's read write. This one says read write and it says read only, what is it? Read only. So we'll see the combinations there and we'll make sure that this is uh, correctly. Well, it looks like it's correct now, but. Make sure it's not ambiguous. So this does not, for instance, like no matter what the setting is, override the next level down. It's more like it just enforces the most restrictive possible. Right? So if this guy says it's read only, it doesn't matter what any of the page tables it points to say, they're read only. They set themselves as read write or not. Whether so they set the next pages as read write or not. Alright. Anyways. User supervisor, this is the big one in terms of the data access before. We were saying, based on the segmentation, all of the segments overlap. We don't think that it's the case that you can jump between them because we know that intersegment jumps are, uh, intersegment jumps have those CPL versus DPL sort of checks. But as far as I was thinking right now, I'm pretty sure the data access is, so if you try to read data out of the kernel and you were just having segment level permissions, I believe that should be totally fine because in terms of memory space, it's all just zero to F, 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 F. But this is where you start making it so that user space can't access the data of kernel space, can't read it or write it. Read about read, writing it. User supervisor flag at the page level says, and this is another case where whatever is set here is most restrictive on any of the page tables it points at, it says, look, all of this memory below this, all of the memory that I can translate through this entry, if I set this to 1, user mode stuff can access it. So 1 implies user mode, but 0 implies supervisor. And in particular, supervisor here does not just mean 0. It means 0, 1, or 2. So if I have kernel memory, which I already said, we probably want to map kernel memory into every user space process so that when it needs to call a kernel function eventually, that we've got this caching is still the same. It doesn't have to destroy the cache when it goes from user space context to kernel space context. So we want to cache that stuff and set those global flags and things like that. But the user supervisor page is about making it so that when you try to read the kernel's memory, you fail. Right? As if your user, if you're ring three, you may not read any of the memory that's mapped through this translation. And we'll come back to this again. And the only one thing I want to say about this right now is that it can even be the case that the kernel is, oh, that really has to do with the previous statement. Should we do this? Right, so before I would have talked about user supervisor, what I really would have wanted to, oh no, it's, it's actually both. Oh, but is it user supervisor as well? Yeah, oh yeah, that's right, yes. You know, late in the day, I don't even understand my sound size. All right, so what I wanted to say here is that both of these two previous bits that I just talked about interact with a flag in the control registers that we didn't even talk about yet. So it can actually be the case that it's so locked down that even the kernel may not write to a piece of data that is marked as read-only, right? So the kernel is supposed to be all privileged and all that stuff, right? But this is not a security feature. This is an error checking sort of feature, right? So if you have your kernel trying to write to data which is mapped as read-only, you kind of want to know about it. There's something going wrong here, right? So not for security purposes, but for error checking purposes. There's a flag in the CR0 register called WP or write protect. And if write protect is set to 1, that means even if your supervisor, even if your kernel, you may not write to your own read-only pages. But if write protect is set to zero, then yeah, kernel can scribble over anything it wants anywhere. And so, you know, this is something which is mentioned early on in the rootkits book and stuff like that. If you've got, you know, 
we said it's not a security mechanism, it's just a sanity checking mechanism. So the kernel, and it's got some data structure like the GDT, IDT, sets it up once, says, yeah, good, done. Marks it as read only, right? Should not be modified after this. So if some rookie comes along and it just, you know, tries to go like, hey, I'm going to modify the IDT, that's marked as read only, write protect is in effect, and therefore it can't do that. There will be, you know, a general protection fault, again, one of those sort of error conditions. But obviously, the kernel module, the rootkit or whatever, can come along and just, you know, set the right protect to zero and then modify whatever it wants because it's not a security feature. It's an error checking feature. So. But does CR, so zero, zero must change for corresponding when CR3 changes or something? Um, zero, zero must change when CR3 changes. No. It's really the case that in a normal OS, it's always just going to have right protect set, whether you're in user space, kernel space, something like that. Right? You should not be able to write to your stuff. Now, if you write to something, and, th and that's actually, you definitely will see that in user space. If you do not, if you've ever noticed, if you've ever tried even in a user space program, if you try, you take a user space program, you analyze its PE headers, and you say, aha, okay, here's the R data section, here's a string. In your user space program, go ahead and try to modify that string, right? You know that in C, strings are immutable and you can't change them, right? Go ahead and try to modify that in a, in a place that the kernel has mapped because of the headers. The kernel has mapped the R data as read only. Try to modify it, you will get an exception. That exception is because the kernel has mapped it as read only. The CR0 write protect is always set to be one so that you should not be able to write this stuff uh, and therefore you're just going to get an exception. But really the right protect is more about when you're in supervisor level mode, whether or not you can be, you know, really all privileged or not, or whether you're trying to stop yourself from screwing up the rest of the thing. So but you should always think of it being the case that in a normal system, CR0 is always just has the right protect bit set. So that's why even in user space, even in kernel space, with default normal code that's not trying to be malicious, it can't write to read only memory. It's only in the case when you're in kernel mode that you can go ahead and reset that and write to read only memory. This one, and it's a write of the page, it doesn't matter. Right. It's run, if it's a writable page, it's writable, no matter what. It's only when it's a readable, read only page that you're protecting it against writes with this write protect bit. Alright, so that, let's see. Okay, this is the access matrix. And we're going to leave it there. Oh, we get, we even got more PDE things. We're going to leave it there for, for today and we're going to um, come back to this tomorrow. But this is just again to, to reemphasize that there are page directory level permissions with respect to is this user space or is this supervisor? Is this read only or is this read write? And this table basically breaks down, you know, what's actually in effect. So if you are in user memory, so you are CPL or privilege level of three, and if you're trying to access something where the page directory says this is a read only, everything below this is read only, then it doesn't matter whether the page table says it's read only or whether the page table says it's read write. This page directory takes precedence and it says, look, you get read only. Right? So you can go look at that matrix, make sure everything makes sense to you, but it's really just saying page directory level user versus user versus supervisor and readable versus writable, those overrule any page tables which are below them, right? So if you want to have any page table that can have writable memory, you better make sure that the page directory is set to writable. And then you can set at a more granular level, each page table can either be writable or read only that sort of thing. Well, that's it for today. Uh, any questions from anyone here?